So here's just a quick rundown of, of you know, what we're going to cover today. I'm going to do a brief uh, introduction to sort of high level uh, introduction of visualization and um, you know, things that, uh, that you'll, you'll want to know about um, moving forward. And then um, we have an, a number of speakers that are going to talk about specific uh, uh, visualization tools. Um, and some of those will be, will be hands on. Um, some of them will just be sort of high level, um, talking about some of the things you can do with those tools. Uh, and then, um, well, you see the schedule there. There's um, time for, for breaks and lunch, and um, there'll be some more hands-on in the afternoon, um, just before dinner. Uh, and then we have uh, a speaker from NVIDIA uh, that's going to come for our after-dinner talk tonight. Okay, so I'll get started. So this is um, uh, overview of what I'm going to talk about, and so we'll be. I'll give you a handful of examples of um, of some visualizations that, that our team has done. Talk a little bit about um, visualization resources uh, that we have available. I think you're probably familiar with Cooley. Um, talk a little bit about tools and formats. Uh, I'll spend the bulk of, of the time talking about different types of data representations. Right, so um, uh, ways you want to be able to to represent your data um, and and hopefully make help get some insight from it. Um, talk a little bit about um, uh, outside of doing viz for the end product, um, we can also use it for debugging and things like this, and so that can be useful. I'll show a couple of examples of that, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Silvio, and he's going to talk a bit about um, in situ viz and analysis. Okay, so first, just a couple of, of you know, quick examples of some, some um, viz that we've worked on. Uh, this is an example of uh, massive stars uh, that can be on the order of 100 times the size of the sun. Um, but despite this intense gravity, uh, uh, the intense gravity that these stars have, um, they also lose mass, right? And so they have these outbursts of gas that leave them in so uh, the goal of this project is to try to understand um, you know, what, the, what that process is and how that happens. Um, this is looking at uh, blood, through, blood flow through complex arteries. Um, in particular, they're interested in how the flow can carry um, cancer cells. Uh, and this is actually uh, one of the projects that's part of, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Aurora. Um, and I know Bill showed you some of that the other day when you took a tour. Um, and so, this is from a project that's part of our, our early science program that's um, preparing applications um, to be able to run on Aurora once, they, um, once the, the resource comes available. Um, we also work with uh, corporate partners as well. And so this is uh, TAE Technologies. Um, they're building devices uh, for magnetic confinement um, to contain hot plasma that's, that's uh, needed to fuel Fusion. Um, uh, this is a more recent one. I may touch on this one again later. Um, this is looking at turbulence uh, of combustion engines, right? And so they're, they want to understand how fuel is distributed uh, throughout the chamber uh, in order to, to design uh, more fuel efficient, um, better burning engines. So here's just a couple quick examples of various uh, material science um, type applications. Um, the one on the right in particular uh, is um, a process called uh, superlubricity. And so what we're looking at there is all, they're all um, carbon atoms and the, the yellow thing in the middle there is a, a gold nano diamond. Um, and the scroll that you see, the red that's wrapping around it, um, is, is what the source of this super lubricity is, right? So it's, it, it wraps around this, this nano diamond and reduces the surface area um, between it and the substrates um, above and below. And so that reduces the amount of friction um, that, that's happening there. Uh, so I mentioned I would talk about um, Viz resources. So you may be familiar now with Cooley which is our, our visualization analytics cluster. Um, it's a 126 node cluster. 
uh, that has um, NVIDIA K80 uh, GPUs um, and significantly has uh, 384 gigabytes of RAM, so it um, has lots of memory. Um, and in particular, the other thing that you want to know about it is that it shares a file system, all the, the file systems, um, the Theta file system and Eagle and Grand, uh, uh, the three luster file systems um, uh, with the big resources, right? So when you're done computing, you're uh, running your simulations and saving your, your code out to disk, um, you don't need to move that data around. You can use Cooley uh, to load that data back in and do, um, and, and do your visualization and analysis on it. So a little bit about um, tools and data formats. So uh, there's all sorts of tools out there for doing visualization. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, I've highlighted there which some of the ones that are available on Cooley and also on Theta. Um, visit in Paraview, which you'll um, hear a lot more about uh, later today and do a little bit of hands-on. Um, and there's also Insight. So these are our visualization applications that are sort of more general purpose. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. Um, and then there's others that are more domain specific. For example, VMD, which you'll also hear about today, and Vapor. Um, those are you know, they're different science domains that they, they typically work with, but um, uh, those are a couple of examples. And then there's um, APIs, you know, so programming environments for building applications, VTK, um, which pair of you and visit are, are largely built on. Um, there's others that, that leverage the GPU. Um, for example, we have a, a homegrown application called VL3, which does um, shader-based volume and particle rendering, uh, lots of tools for doing um, analysis. Um, you'll hear more about um, um, working with uh, Jupyter later today um, in that space. And of course, there's a number of utilities like you new know, plot, image magic for manipulating images, those sorts of things. So visit and pair view um, versus VTK, for example. So as I said, visit and pair view are general purpose of visual, visualization applications, right? So um, they're appropriate for um, many different science domains. It's primarily GUI based, uh, both of them are. And so they have um, client server models that, that support uh, remote visualization. And we'll um, do a little bit of hands-on um, this afternoon about um, working in that mode, right? So you can have uh, a server that runs on Cooley, for example, um, and it can run in parallel there. And that does all the heavy lifting of reading data from disk, applying um, visualization algorithms, uh, and doing the rendering. And then you connect to that with a lightweight client that you run on your laptop. Um, and essentially, it can, you can have that server send either geometry, if it's small enough, and then do the rendering locally, or um, you can do the rendering remotely and just essentially send pixels over the wire. Um, so both of these tools are, are uh, scriptable and extendable, right? So one of the primary ways that we use it um, is for doing uh, for exploring data in this client server mode. And then once we establish our pipelines, we can save the state or session um, and, uh, and then use that to script it so that I could then go off and say, submit a batch job to, do, to render off an animation, for example. Um, as I mentioned, they're both built largely on top of VTK. Uh, and they both um, have in situ capabilities. And Silvio will talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but essentially that what the, the gist of that is that um, as our resources continue to get bigger, right, we can compute more and more data, but the, the rate at which we can save that data off the disk um, is not growing as quickly, right? And so the gap between how much data you can compute and how much data you save uh, continues to widen, right? And so to address that, um, there's a lot of work in the HPC visualization community um, to do in situ, right? So to, to do visit analysis on the data while it's still in memory before you end up throwing it away, um, since we can't save it all. Um, 
And then VTK, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's more of a programming environment, uh, an API, so um, it has some additional capabilities that, that um, are not available um, directly in, in pair view and visit. Um, gives you some finer control. Um, but as I mentioned, the, those other applications are scriptable and extendable, so you could write custom plugins in VTK and enable those through those other tools. Um, but then again, it also requires more expertise. It's more, um, you know, you're doing more coding as opposed to maybe just um, uh, using the, the, the abilities of the tool. Um, so here's a, a, a brief list of some of the data file formats that are available in, in Visit and Pair View. Again, by no means an exhaustive list, uh, and it's growing all the time. Um, and as I mentioned, if, if, if you're uh, the format of choice for the, the codes that you're running um, isn't on this list, you can you know, write a custom reader, a plugin, um, and enable that through, uh, through those tools as well. So like I said, I'm gonna spend probably the most time um, of, of my, my time on data representations, right? So what do you do with, with data once, you, once you've computed it and you wanna try and understand what's in it? So what are some of the representations you can use, right? So one of the base, most basic ones is cutting planes, right? And it's exactly what it sounds like. You put a slice, a plane through, the, through um, in particular, a data set that has some, um, some mesh. Um, and then you can apply additional methods um, on the resulting plane, right? And typically you would, um, so you, you, you cut this a slice through and then you color it by um, some scalar field um, within the data set. Um, uh, Visit and Pair View and VTK are all good at this. Um, VMD also has some similar capabilities um, for some data formats for doing this. Uh, another basic representation is volume rendering, right? And so this is where you have a volume of data, um, for example, MRI, CT scans, this sort of thing. Um, we do this a lot with um, data that's collected at the Vance Photon source. You guys had a tour of that the other day. Um, and so basically the, there's a number of, of different um, algorithms for doing this, but one of the most popular ones um, because of its... Um, the way it's, it's uh, there's, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the, it's uh, ray casting. Um, and so you cast rays through a volume and take samples along the way. And at each sample, you, you look up the value that you find. Um, and then you have a lookup table of, of color and opacity um, that you assign to that sample. Um, and you essentially do that for each pixel in the image um, to come up with the final image. Um, and so, for example, um, you can base the, the ranges, the colors on ranges of data. So, for example, um, this little mouse guy that's up there, right? So we know that um, bone, de density of bone is within a particular density range. Muscle and other tissues, cartilage, are all different ranges of value. So you can assign different colors to those different value ranges. Um, in order to represent different types of material. Uh, so contours or isosurfaces or isolines in the case of 2D. Um, essentially, it's a surface or a line in 2D um, that represents a constant value throughout the data set. Um, and so, for example, in the lower left, um, this is a mixing of some fluids. And so you can see that there's four different surfaces there. Each of those surfaces is a different um, ISO value, um, and then they're colored accordingly. Um, by contrast, the one in the upper right, um, that's a single contour. And so we're looking at a specific ISO value, but then we're coloring it by another scalar field in the data set. Um, and again, visit and pair view both really good at this. Same with VTK, um, requires a little more effort again, um, but all doable. 
Uh, so glyphs, uh, another representation. So this is, these are essentially um, for particle-based data sets where, uh, or point-based data sets, right? So you, you represent the data with some 2D or 3D geometric object. Um, its location is dictated by the coordinate. Um, either the 3D location on a mesh or position in a table or graph, for example, in 2D. Um, and then, and, and this is really the, the heart of, of data viz, is that you take attributes of the data and assign graphical attributes to represent them, right? And so in this case, uh, for example, the sphere that's, that's there, the, you see the, um, the arrows on it, those are um, representing the velocity on the surface of this, of, of this object. And so um, this, in this case, both the scale and the color um, are based on the velocity value. Um, right, and then it, it can also be, again, sort of the, the top one uh, is a fuel injection, and so the, the color is based on the, on the velocity. Um, and in the lower right, they're just based on type. Right, and so um, basically, depending on the attributes in your data, um, you can use any of those to, to, to color um, these glyph type representations. So another uh, representation that's often used uh, is streamlines. And so this is from vector field data. So um, vector field on a mesh, so there needs to be connectivity and so it's essentially showing the direction, if you were to put a, C, a particle into this flow field, um, show the direction that element would travel at any point in time. Um, and so within a single time step, it traces that path, right? And so you look at a position, see what, what's the vector for, from that position, and then you move to the next position, and so on, right? And so you, you form this path. Uh, this streamline. Um, again, all these tools are, are good at that. Another representation, of which is sort of an extension of that, is path lines. And the main difference there is that, um, again, it's from a vector field, so there needs to be connectivity. But in this case, instead of tracing within a single time step, um, you're tracing a path an element will travel over time, right? So from one time step to that, you, you you start in some position, you go to the, you know, where would that particle end up? And then you go to the next time step and say, okay, if I'm here now, where would I go, right? And so you trace it over time, not just within um, a single time step. Um, so it's, it's time dependent and also um, more computationally expensive. Um, so I mentioned there's some representations that are more domain specific, right? And so here's a number of, of different representations for um, molecular dynamics data. So VMD, um, again, you'll hear more about that today. Um, lots of domain specific representations. Um, so you can do things like find the backbone of a, of a, a, a protein or a, a compound. Um, Right, often you set the display attribute by the, by the atom type. Um, again, visit and pair view. Uh, do have some, um, some limited and, and I think growing um, capabilities for doing these types of, of domain type, domain specific types of viz. Um, and again, VTK, anything's possible if you try hard enough. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk um, for a minute or two about, um, so what the, all the stuff that I've shown so far is mostly sort of the end product, right? How do you um, convey the science or you know, investigate um, what's happening um, on the science side of the data, but we can also use it for things like debugging, right? To I, try and understand what's happening in our code. And so this is an example that I like to show. Um, where what we're looking at is two um, marine propellers, and they're going to rotate in opposite directions. Um, and the, there's going to be flow from right to left. And so the science team that was, that was simulating this 
they were getting unexpected results and they couldn't, they didn't understand why that was. And so um, I worked with them to, to visualize. And so keep your eye on the propeller on the right. Right, so over time, it went away, <laughs> right? So there was some problem in their code where they were not reinitializing something or something along those lines. And so it wasn't until we did this visualization that brought their attention to the fact that, oh, we need to go back and do this, right? And so um, visualizing it helped um, uh, illustrate that for them. And so this is, here is, what they were expecting to see once they fixed the problem. You can kind of see inside uh, the little white region there is the propellers. Um, and they were expecting to see these vortices that are forming. And of course, with only one propeller, they weren't getting this, um, uh, they weren't getting this result. And so um, one instance where you can leverage visualization for debugging. Uh, another case is for doing diagnostics. For example, um, I mentioned that we have a, a homegrown code for doing um, volume rendering, and it, uh, we were trying to, um, we were working on parallelizing it. Well, it was already parallel uh, in terms of distributed, but we wanted to, we, were, we were adding threads, um, OpenMP threads to it, and we were trying to understand um, what was the best layout of, of how to distribute the data across those threads. And so the image you see here, right, we're, we're visualizing the data, you know, it's a data volume, and it's colored by um, the value within the data. But instead, what we did was we took the same code, instead of looking up the value, um, we assigned it to the, the idea of the thread that was doing the processing rather than the actual data value. Right, and as you can see, by changing those things, we get a completely different layout of, of how, you know, the data is laid out ac across the threads in a much different way. Now, I don't remember off the top of my head which one of these ended up being the most efficient, but um, it did help us identify um, and distinguish the behavior depending on how we did the thread layout. And so, just another example of, of using visualization beyond just sort of the end product. So the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Silvio is um, a little bit about advanced rendering, right? So a lot of the images that you've seen me show already um, have various levels of um, realism in them. And so there's um, a lot of work going on um, in the Viz community to improve on that. And so one of them is uh, using Intel's um, one API rendering toolkit. And so within that, it uses, um, as a part of the toolkit, uh, there's a, a, it has a ray tracing um, package called Osprey. Um, and it enables things like advanced lighting. Um, and it, ha it does uh, what it calls denoising, right? So images when they're ray traced can be really um, <coughs> essentially noisy, right? Because you, you um, shoot a bunch of rays into the scene and um, it takes a long time to resolve all of them. And so uh, it, has a, it uses um, a machine learning algorithm um, to, once you do some small number of samples, um, it can start doing some machine learning to essentially fin fill out the rest of the, the image for you, um, which improves the quality and also the speed. And so there's a number of examples from, um, from Intel, some of them are um, images you've seen already that I presented. These are some of the, some of the ones that, um, many of them are, are, are ones that we produced for them or produced using their tools. And so just a quick sort of overview. Like I said, at the, at the low level, they have this image denoise, um, open VKL, which is the, the volume kernel a library and Embry, uh, which is, uh, um, also for doing um, ray traversals. And then Osprey is the, is the renderer that I mentioned that sits on top of all of that. And the nice thing is it's being integrated into a lot of the tools that I've already talked about, 
right, visit Paraview VMD all have um, either they have backend renderers that can leverage um, one API. Um, I don't have a slide on it, but there's also um, NVIDIA also has similar uh, libraries for doing um, ray tracing and volume rendering. Um, uh, and those are also being integrated into, in the, into a lot of these same tools. All right, so with that, I'm gonna, we're gonna switch gears a little bit over to in situ visit analysis, and I'm gonna turn it over to Silvio for that. Thanks, Joe. So uh, for those who were not there uh, on Saturday, I'm Silvio Ritzi, computer scientist at the Argon Leadership Computing Facility. And we'll uh, give you a brief overview of in situ vision analysis, the technologies available, the frameworks that you can use. And as a motivation, we have this slide. Uh, it's actually old, uh, but on purpose, actually. This, uh, this was an observation from our community on Titan uh, the supercomputer at uh, Oak Ridge, and it was retired a few years ago already. So this, this is an early observation, right? Uh, and essentially noticing that there's a five order of magnitude gap uh, between the, the compute, the, the flops, and the I.O. capacity. That is not changing drastically now, especially with the uh, exascale computers. So that gap still remains and it may, maybe it's even increasing. So we need to do something for this, right? So that, that was the, the observation probably a decade ago. So uh, what, what are the, 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 the things that we need to do? How, how do we solve the problem? Uh, and the problems are essentially that you can't save all the data that you're generating uh, because of storage limitations or because the I.O. limitations, right? Uh, it's not possible to save the massive data sets that are generated in this uh, large simulations. Uh, so with that, there's, there's also the problem of, of loss of science, right? Because if you're saving every 100 time steps, something may happen in between and, and, and you'll miss that. Um, so there's the potential problem of loss of science. So uh, the idea is of in situ vision analysis, the main idea is essentially run the in situ vis uh, or analysis algorithms while the data is in memory, right? Avoiding the, the, the file system as much as you can. So uh, you compute one, one time step of the simulation, share the data with the in situ vis and analysis components, uh, do the processing that you need there, and you can release all that data now. So that, that is ideal, right? It, it, it doesn't happen. And, and in most cases, but that's, that's the main thing that, that we propose. That's the, that's the idea proposed here. So there's an, a huge number of uh, frameworks for doing this. And I'm gonna cover here, the, the ones that I'm listing here are the ones that we're familiar with, the ones that we can support at the ALCF, right? But there are many more. So, uh, and, and, and if you're gonna run in one of the facilities, you're wel also welcome to bring your own solutions, right? But this, this are, uh, these are the ones that, that we can help with, that we're familiar with, and that, that we know the developers, so we can quickly fix issues if there are any issues. Uh, and and the, the list starts with Alpine, which is a, a, a project, part of the Exascale uh, computing project. Uh, and it aims at providing the, uh, all the infrastructures and all the algorithms needed for in situ vision analysis in Exascale. Right? Um, I'm part of the team, Cyrus also here is part of the team, so reach out to us if, if you would like to learn more about this. I'm, I'm gonna share a slide and links later. Uh, the next is uh, Ascent, uh, which is also a lightweight framework for in situ vis and analysis. Again, this is part of the Exascale Computing Project. Uh, uh, it's one of the technologies in Alpine. And again, Cyrus is uh, one of the main developers so talk to him if, if you want to know more about it. Uh, similarly, there's, there's Sensei, another project uh, funded by the uh, DOA Office of Science. Um, and here, the, the main idea is that, that you write your instrumentation, your in-situ instrumentation once, 
and you can uh, you write it and you can run it everywhere. So you can swap the backends. And I'm, I'm going to show a little bit about that. Uh, Joe and I are, are part of, of this team as well. So talk to us if, if, if you're interested. Um, Paraview has uh, a component for in situ vision analysis called Catalyst, which is essentially a library. Uh, you, you link it with your code, instrument your code, uh, and then you, you have all the, the, the in situ vision analysis cap capabilities of uh, Paraview and, and the VTK libraries there, and you can script it with Python. It's, it's, it's super powerful. Uh, so there will be a talk about uh, Paraview today, and a talk to Dan from Kidware or any of the Kidware folks if, if you're interested in knowing more or, or if you would like to use this. We can also help with that. Um, Libsim is the, the uh, in situ component of Visit. Uh, again, uh, you can link your simulation with Libsim and it will give you Visit in situ, essentially. Cyrus is also part of, of this project. Uh, and finally, one that is, is new here, uh, that, but we've been working with and, and essentially trying to enable it on Aurora technologies. Uh, this is SmartSim from uh, HPE. HPE is the vendor actually that, uh, that, will, uh, that is actually deploying, helping us deploy Aurora. Uh, and so this, this is a, a new framework. It's based on Python. It's, it's uh, mainly interested in learning uh, libraries. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk more about this. So uh, I'm not part of the team, but I can facilitate uh, uh, reaching out to HPE. So l let's start with Alpine, right? So this, uh, this chart here tries to show how uh, Alpine, uh, as part of the Exascale computing project, integrates this technologies, the frameworks, and the, the infrastructures, right? So as I mentioned, one of the, uh, the, the main uh, in situ infrastructures there is Ascent, right? Uh, but there's also the Libsyn component of Visit and the Catalyst component of Fairview. So all, all these three technologies provide the in situ capabilities there. But there's also a strong focus on in situ algorithms uh, as part of this project, right? So multiple algorithms are already implemented that, that, uh, that people can leverage immediately. Uh, there's also a component of compression called the CFP. And if, if you look at the, uh, the, the lower layer, everything is uh, provided by a framework called VTKM. Uh, so this, are, this is a way of accelerating uh, algorithms on uh, multiple uh, uh, processors or accelerators, and I'll, I'll have a slide about that. Uh, there's also, as, as I mentioned, and in, in, in situ vision analysis, it's, it's super important to capture your output or your artifact, right? So that's that's what you try. You try to minimize uh, the the use of the file system. So th this is where well, where Cinema as as another project helps, and I'll I'll give you an overview of that later. And for, for post-processing, uh, we rely on, on Paraview and Visit in, in the ways that you will see in talks today, right? In, in, in the client-server mode, where you can load data that's been already produced by the big simulations. So quick overview about Ascent, and I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, this a lot because Cyrus is here, and I know he, he will cover uh, uh, part of this. But it's a flyweight design, right? So I, I reused some of, of their slides, but uh, I just wanted to mention it here, but not going to spend a lot of time on this, hoping that uh, Cyrus will cover this in, in the Jupyter uh, notebook session uh, in the evening. And a little bit more about uh, Sensei. Uh, and I mentioned already that the, the idea here is that you instrument the code, put some few lines of, of code in the simulation uh, code, right? And with that, the simulation is, is ready uh, to run in situ, and you can swap the backends that, that you're going to use for this and analysis. So the picture here tries to show the, the, the multiple things that we can do. And uh, so for example, uh, you can use Catalyst uh, here. Uh, I mentioned Catalyst as an, as an independent uh, framework, right? part of Paraview. But we can also interface with Catalyst from Sensei. And, and similar with uh, Libsim and Invisit, right, and Ascent. Uh, so there, there's a lot of infrastructures here that, that can be used. And 
there's also something important here, and I'm, I'm going to demonstrate that with a quick video, that is M-to-N communication, and, and that we call that, uh, in the community, we call that in transit, not in situ. We call it in transit vision analysis when there's some data movement from the simulation to a different set of resources. Could be some nodes in the same supercomputer, could be a, a, another supercomputer, or could be another resource, but there's some data transport there. And normally there's an M rank to N rank communication there, some kind of reduction. So that is also enabled in, in Sensei. Uh, and so here's the demo that, uh, that I promised. There's, uh, there's nothing graphics here. It's, it's mostly looking at terminals. Uh, but the, the good thing is, and let me go back to this, the last bullet point, all this uh, workflow that I'm, I'm going to demonstrate you can download and you can reproduce because it's, it's containerized uh, and there's a producer and consumer containers and all the recipes to build the containers and the scripts to, to replicate this. So the idea here, and, and I hope it's readable, it seems to be readable, uh, two terminals, uh, the left on the Theta GPU supercomputer, or that's, that's a GPU partition of Theta and you may be already familiar with it. Uh, and on the right is the session on Cooley, uh, the vision analysis cluster, right? So the, they have a network interconnect through the uh, ALCF backbone. And so on the left, I'm, I'm running uh, 16 ranks of LAMPS, the, the molecular dynamics simulator, instrumented with Sensei. The network transport is through ADIOS, another uh, infrastructure of the Exascale computing project. And on the right, the, on the vision analysis cluster, there's uh, the Sensei endpoint receiving this data in four ranks. So 16 simulation ranks talking to four vision analysis ranks. To make this the, the most simple thing possible, uh, what we're doing is saving the data in VTK format. But there's, uh, we can do anything from there, right? Uh, that is the simplest thing, but you can do, sim you can do uh, visualization uh, or, or you can do multiple other things. So let, let me quickly run this, assuming that I can get my pointer right. Uh, and it, uh, you can see that um, the producer container is launched on the left side. Uh, and then the consumer is on the right. Uh, it's telling that the ADIOS data adapter is already uh, configured and the analysis is, is going to be VTK plus hoc IO, which is uh, saving data in VTK format. So the time steps on the simulation are already going. Five time steps to keep it simple and the uh, analysis is processing them, receiving them through the network, uh, converting them to four from 16 ranks to four ranks and saving to disk, right? Um, and you will see here that the, the files are generating, are generated there in a directory. When this finishes, you can also see that the, the consumer finished, the, the producer finished. So in, in that directory, there's the VTK files for every time step. So uh, I have a, this slide with additional information that shouldn't be here, it should be at, at the end, but uh, I'm gonna move it uh, to the end and share the slides so that you have the links for all the things that uh, we're talking about. Uh, and then a, a quick overview of uh, SmartSIM from HPE. And so in this case, uh, the block diagram there is, is similar to what we've been seeing so far, right? The, the big simulation on the left, instrumented with smart SIM. And then uh, the main purpose here is actually doing uh, training and inference in situ, right? So while the simulation is running, you can do training and inference. And they're, they're actually, that, that is actually their focus. And that's a problem that, that they're aiming at. Uh, everything is, is Python friendly here and uh, they're prepared to mostly move Python arrays. Uh, so uh, frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow will be happy with the data that, that they, they receive, right? Uh, 
This is actually, this has been demonstrated on the Theta supercomputer, this workflow. Uh, Polaris has been uh, recently online. Uh, you've probably heard of, of, of Polaris, uh, an NVIDIA uh, supercomputer that, that we recently deployed. So I know that they're, they're going to work on demonstrating this, and they've, they've used uh, real science, actually, to uh, real uh, simulation codes to instrument and, and demonstrate this. So I'm, I'm going to move to the couple last slides since we're running late. Uh, so I, I wanted to quickly touch on VTKM, and as, as I showed uh, earlier, this is the uh, underlying infrastructure that enables all the projects in uh, uh, the Alpine project as part of the Exascale computing project. Uh, and the idea here is you see multiple layers, right? So on the, on the top, you see the, the algorithms. And this is actually focusing on visualization algorithms. So all of, of those things, and in fact, Joe already covered most of them uh, graphically. So this is an implementation uh, trying to take advantage of the intranode parallelism and trying to accelerate the code on accelerators, right? So uh, this, this layer provided by VTKM can actually run in the, in the multiple uh, computer technologies available today, like x86, CUDA, uh, Xeon 5, for example, for the, or the KNL available on Theta. And it says upcoming there, but it's been already demonstrated uh, on Frontier at Oak Ridge. And in fact, they're, they're running already there. And uh, the XE is a, uh, Intel Technologies, and we're also working on enabling that. So we have it running also on the uh, early access hardware representing Aurora. Final slide. Uh, it's about cinema. That, that is also, uh, I wanted to share this, because it may be useful to some of you. The idea uh, here is essentially convert everything to images, generate image database, databases, right? So rather than saving full time steps, the idea that they propose is essentially creating a, a database of images for every time step, trying to cover the, the, the things that you want to see, that the science team will want to see, right? So for example, multiple levels or cameras in, in multiple places, trying to cover, for example, the, the entire, uh, uh, trying to give an entire rotation through the data set, maybe, uh, or different levels of depth uh, into the, the data set. So in a paper that they had in supercomputing 2014, they demonstrated that this is actually, uh, this reduces several orders of magnitude, the data that you save to disk, right? So uh, you don't need to save a, a, a full time step with this. You can save this cinema database that will represent what you're looking for, and, and you can explore it offline later. So they provide the specification of the cinema database, how you, how you write it, and they also provide viewers, right? So, so those viewers are interactive, and you can move sliders to move the, your time step or, or move the parameters that, that you changed during the simulation, right? And it's also important to note that this is already enabled in pair view, visit, and ascent. So you can save the cinema databases from these tools. With that, we conclude the overview. And I just want to show the, uh, some additional resources that, uh, that we have. Uh, essentially, the, the visualization team at the ALCF is here to help. All users of the facility are priority. But if you're not a user of, of the facility, uh, we can also talk to you. And we'll be happy to try it try to help with this. So with that, we'll be happy to take any questions. And hopefully it didn't go too much over time. Question there. Um, the in-situ visualization, which you were showing earlier, uh, where you actually transfer the, uh, you processing the, the data from the time step, how does that impact amp application runtime? Okay, that's, that is a great question. So the question is, uh, when, when you instrument an application for in-situ visit analysis, how, the, how, how it impacts the application runtime? And yes, there, 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 there's an impact, right? Uh, you want to minimize that, make it 5, 10% maybe of the total execution time. Uh, but, but yeah, there, there's always an impact. Not only that, there's also 
uh, the impact of adding additional building the code with additional libraries, right? So that's, for example, what Ascent tried to solve. It's, uh, they want to make it minimal and lightweight, right? So the, the modifications that you need to the, that, that you make to the simulation code. But yeah, that's unavoidable, yeah. And the good thing of in transit, uh, based on analysis, is that if you put the data in a buffer and, and transfer it over the network, the simulation can continue, right? So if you buffer, it, if, if you buffer the data somewhere and move it, uh, the simulation can continue and, 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 and it's uh, not blocked. And there's another thing uh, also. Um, Simulations, and, and the example that I showed, that was a toy example, right? So the, the, the number of uh, atoms that I was simulating was really small. That, that's not a real simulation. But in most cases, those are going to be huge. And time steps, uh, computing a time step might take 30 minutes to an hour for a big simulation, right? Just to give you an, an, an idea. Uh, Moving the data compared, compared to those 30 minutes, uh, it's, it's a small percentage of, of that time. Or even, even doing some minimal VIS, uh, right? It's a small percentage of that time. So it, it depends highly on the problem. Uh, and, and there's always possibilities to fine tune it. Question there. Hey, thanks for the talk. I have a question about, uh, I guess, decoupling the model from the visualization. Because when we talk about sharing memory and maybe blocking communications or crash in the visualization, I don't want that to wreck my three-day model run. Um, so are there tips or concerns? Is that a concern or is there tips to avoid it? It is a concern. And, and if, if the question was not recorded, it, it's about... The question is about what happens when you instrument a simulation, right? Can you crash it? Uh, uh, is, is, uh, are there concerns about it? And yeah, the, the, there are concerns about that. So uh, again, one of the possibilities is reducing the libraries that you need to link with. Uh, so Ascent takes care of that. Sensei did something uh, to minimize the, the impact recently. So, so they, they moved uh, that you don't need to link with the VTK, with the entire VTK library, uh, because uh, now there's a small representation within uh, Sensei, so that reduces also the, the footprint. Uh, and uh, Catalyst also, and in its newer version, 2.0, they also minimize, try to minimize the impact, right? So they, they link in runtime. So they, they give you, um, uh, dynamic library that, that you use to build the code and then replace that dynamic library at runtime. But again, that is something really light. So yes, the, the, definitely the, there are concerns and, and people are working to, uh, you know, overcome those things. Mm -hmm. Yes, question there. Um, do these institution methods only give me like one or a couple of cameras for my data or can I move and pan uh, the camera or um, animation afterwards. Right. So, so the question is uh, if, if you can have multiple views of, of the data, right, in situ. And, and the, the answer is yes, right? So you're free in, in the in situ uh, part of, of, the, of the runs. You are free to do anything you want, right? So you can script your visualization to generate multiple views. And if you're running a cinema database, if you're generating a cinema database, it, it's, it's got by default multiple camera views that you can set, right? So the, the, the answer is yes. Can I change those views after my run, though? No. No, you can't. No, because those are pre-digested. But the cinema idea is that you do a whole bunch of renders, so you get pseudo-interactive at the end of the day. So it's not just one slice. You might have you know, 10 views and <coughs> So it's better. It's not perfect, but it's better. Okay. You can also do in, in cinema, for example, you can change parameters, right? Like, for example, the value of your ISO surface. So you can compute ISO surfaces at multiple values and activate one when you're uh, one of them when you when you are uh, exploring the data uh, after the simulation finished. So 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 you can try to find the ideal after uh, the, the simulation is done. You can also do interactive, right? Yes. While Depending on how you have things set up, you could do 
run, say, a, a live Fairview or Visit client that's, that's tied to a server, this is most likely do this more in, 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 in transit, right, where you move the data to another resource that you run those tools interactively, and then you have full control while the simulation's 